From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Today we'll tell you the story of legal scholar Ilya Shapiro and Georgetown University Law School. Georgetown hired Mr. Shapiro, a libertarian-minded scholar who often contributes to the Wall Street Journal, to run its Center for the Constitution. He was ready to start working when he issued a tweet that criticized President Biden's plan to nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court to fill the opening upon the retirement of Justice Stephen Breyer. The tweet said the best candidate was Sri Srinivasan of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals rather than what he called a, quote, lesser black woman, unquote. The tweet itself created something of a controversy in left-wing circles and in Georgetown, and the dean of the Georgetown Law School, William Trainer, suspended Mr. Shapiro pending an investigation. After four months, Ilya was reinstated last week, and at first he welcomed the decision. But upon reflection, he has changed his mind, and on Monday morning, he resigned in a letter to Dean Trainer. We have Ilya Shapiro with us this morning. Pleasure to have him here. Welcome, Ilya. Good to hear from you. Good to be on, Paul. So why did you change your mind about working at Georgetown Law? Well, later in the afternoon on Thursday, uh, probably around the time when I was writing my initial piece for the journal, I got the report in my inbox from the IDEAA, the the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Affirmative Action. They were my inquisitors during this sham four-month investigation. And the report, after digesting it, uh, it's a fairly lengthy report with the aid of my lawyer and as well as my wife, who also happens to be a lawyer, and uh, Randy Barnett, my boss, the faculty director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution, it became clear that they had boxed me in. There was no way for me to fulfill my duties, either in terms of teaching or organizing programs or otherwise participating in the life of the law school, enhancing the programming of the Center for the Constitution, because the report said, and this was reiterated by Dean Trainer in his statements to the community and his letter to me, that next time I screwed up, the next time I offended somebody, then that would be cause for discipline. And so in effect, I'd either have to walk on eggshells and self-censor myself or just wait for the other shoe to drop. And I was just not going to participate in this slow motion firing. So let's dig into that thinking a bit. But first, I want to tell our audience, you apologize for the tweet, correct? I did. I said uh, it didn't mean to offend. The tweet came up. I posted it late in the evening. I was uh, traveling on business in Texas and you know, as I wrote in my first piece for you last week, doom scrolling late at night is not a best practice. Uh, uh, and, yes. and, and posting in haste about when you're upset about some public policy or, or whatever else. So anyway, the next morning I woke up, I saw that there was a growing firestorm. I deleted it and I said I phrased it poorly. Uh, I certainly stuck by my underlying message that Supreme Court candidates or any other job seekers pool of candidates should not be limited by race and gender. But I had poorly phrased that. It was inartful. And so I apologized for that. But really, I think it's unreasonable or acting in bad faith to have read it with some bigoted intent or meaning. I certainly agree with that. But you were reinstated then after this investigation on what seems to me to have been kind of a technical justification, which the dean said that was because you weren't formerly an employee when you sent the tweet. The question that comes to mind on that point is, well, Didn't they know that four months ago? How does it take four months to decide that you weren't an employee when you issued the tweet? I mean, this is a law school with lots of learned people. Sure, there's no dispute over the facts of the tweet or when I tweeted it. There's no dispute over the so-called law, the policies, whether on free expression or anti-harassment or discrimination. And so it shouldn't have taken four months to do anything with this so-called investigation. But certainly looking at a calendar could have been done in four seconds, let alone four months. So obviously a kind of a pretext. It was lawyered up. They had hired outside counsel, Wilmer Hale. I'm sure they spent, I don't know, a million dollars on this whole process. They did not admit that, uh, in fact, they gave the impression in Dean Trainer's public statements that if, you know, I had tweeted five days later once I was on board or, you know, let this be a notice to other faculty and staff, that these kinds of comments could make you subject to discipline and, and might not be protected by the vaunted free speech policy. It seems clear that uh, Dean Trainer was waiting here because he was under enormous pressure internally. I mean, there were a thousand people who at one point sent a letter, signed on to 
a formal protest against your joining the school. There was a variety of criticism from members of the faculty, the student body. And, of course, Dean Trainer could have said, I'm sorry you were offended by this, but we have a policy here. It's called speech and expression policy that expressly says it will defend people who make statements that might, in fact, offend uh, some people. I'm sure if you're like me, Ilya, you're offended all the time by things <laughs> that people <laughs> say and do about me. So the question becomes, I guess, and this is maybe the essence of your decision to resign, is, is Georgetown willing to defend that speech and expression policy when somebody like yourself, who's from the center right, is the person who has to be defended. Yeah, obviously Trainer was under pressure, but a lot of it he put on himself. And there were letters signed on my behalf, certainly. Part of the reason why I survived this, why I was not fired immediately, is because unlike a lot of people who get canceled or professors who get in trouble or others for their speech, is I'm very fortunate and privileged to have friends in high places, platforms, you know, Wall Street Journal willing to publish me, that sort of thing. Most people don't have that. And so, you know, one of the lessons from this is if you want to survive a cancellation campaign, then you know, make sure you have good friends willing to write on your behalf, whether in public and in private. That's a discussion for another story of how to survive that. But he could have shut this down. Dean Trainer could have shut this down from the start. It's no mystery. You know, administrators don't have to throw up their hands and say, this is a mess. We can't do anything about it. The Foundation for Individual Rights and Education, which is my new favorite organization, they were stalwart supporters of mine and helped me in various ways. They just today announced a new program that they're expanding their reach beyond educational institutions. But they have documented, they can, you know, proof of concept that if a university president or department head or dean at the outset says, look, I don't necessarily agree with what this person has said, but we have our clear free speech policies, that's it and our due process policies, and we have to dismiss that kind of complaint. And then these things die down. But if you humor or you kowtow to these illiberal mobs braying for the head of people who express wrong speak, then it just feeds the beast and it feeds on itself and it grows and grows and grows. And Dean Trainer, by launching this investigation and kicking the can, you know, all he did was kick the can down the road four months. When he last Thursday reinstated me, he started getting that pressure from the woke mob from the left again. So I think this is probably an error on, I'm mean, definitely an error on his part in not shutting things down from the very beginning for his own sake, let alone my own. Right. Now he's caught between critics on both sides. Let me just read a couple of sentences from your letter to the dean. It said, you told me when we met last week that you want me to be successful in my new role and that you will quote, have my back, unquote, as you put it during our meeting. To the contrary, you've painted a target on my back such as I could never do the job I was hired for, advancing the mission of the Center for the Constitution. So basically you're saying that do you think this was arranged, bring you back on a technical definition that you weren't an employee, but then uh, set you up to be uh, ousted the next time you get a group of people objecting to whatever you might say or do. I think you can't help but analyze the situation in just that way, Paul. There's just no way, you know, it was either to cow me or it was to set me up for kind of my favorite part of my own letter was the list of, I think, four hypothetical situations that are very realistic that could get me in trouble by trouble, meaning somebody is offended and complains. Yeah, well, that would be supporting, say, a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade or supporting gun rights. That's right. Something as simple as that. Exactly. Or this fall, I'm a Supreme Court scholar. I'm a constitutional lawyer. This is part of my job. The Supreme Court is taking up affirmative action this fall. And as I engage in my normal commentary, does that detract from the diversity and equity and inclusion mission of the university and the words that uh, I'm not quoting directly, but Dean Trainer both in his statements back in January and then reiterating it last week that the university is also committed to. So absolutely, I think I was set up for a fall. That's why I ultimately came to the conclusion that this was untenable, that I could not succeed. And I'm not going to live this way of trying to walk on eggshells to avoid the wrath of the diversocrats. Well, as a journalist myself, I know that you can't live that way and practice good journalism. And I assume you can't work that way at a university where you're supposed to be able to debate issues if you are constantly having to check yourself 
from even you know, normal commentary on Supreme Court decisions. There's one other element here that I just want you to elaborate on, and that is your letter to the dean includes examples of center-left members of the faculty who have issued tweets or statements that were defended or for which there was no action taken, yet when you look, <laughs> look at them, many of them were far more incendiary than anything that you tweeted. Let me give you an example. Here we have Professor Carol Christine Fair, who wrote during the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation process, look at this chorus of entitled white men justifying a serial rapist's arrogated entitlement. All of them deserve miserable deaths while feminists laugh as they take their last gas. Bonus. We castrate their corpses and feed them to swine, question mark? Yes, unquote. So that's quite a statement, uh, an incitement to <laughs> violence, if you want to be literal about it. And nothing happened. So there is a double standard here when it comes to defending free speech. Absolutely. My solution to that is not to subject these professors. The most recent one was Josh Chaffetz, who was tweeting in support of the mob to uh, protest outside the justices' houses when the leap of the Dobbs abortion opinion came out just last month. I'm not saying that they all should be investigated or punished. I'm saying that the same standard should be applied to me, that I should not have been investigated or had this sort of Damocles placed over my head for going forward. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, more with Ilya Shapiro. From the opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo, The Wall Street Journal, with uh, Ilya Shapiro, the uh, legal scholar, and he's talking about his back and forth with Georgetown University over his employment and talking, of course, about the Supreme Court as well. So what's next, Ilya? I mean, obviously, you had been associated with the Cato Institute, but you've left that position to join Georgetown. So now you're in the uh, position of looking for work. I have irons in the fire. I actually have some pretty concrete plans, which I'm not at liberty to discuss yet. That'll be the next media cycle, the next press release a little bit down the line. For now, I'm just going to take a deep breath, enjoy my family, my growing family. We're actually expecting twins coming this fall. I already have two little boys. Ah, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. The, the way the timing works out is kind of nice. We're going on a long planned vacation the last two weeks of this month. I'll be turning 45 during that vacation. And so I'll Come back tanned, rested, and ready for the next chapter. I have to say I'm dismayed by your vacation plans. That will coincide with the last two weeks of this momentous uh, Supreme Court term. <laughs> uh, I want to talk to you about now here because <laughs> the uh, Supreme Court issued a couple of opinions today, but they're relatively small cases, non-controversial, one of which was unanimous, another 7-2. But there's more than 30 cases, 30 or 31 cases, if I count correctly, still to be issued this, decisions to be issued this year, this month. And, uh, of course, then the major ones, including guns, abortion, religious liberty, environmental regulation, all still pending. What do you make of the fact that uh, there are so many cases left to be decided? Yeah, they're definitely slow based on recent history of the pace of opinion releases. And so, you, you know, you say this month, that's the normal commentary, you know, June is when they decide the cases. But you know, I think a few years of the last decade or so, they've gone into July, and this looks to be another good candidate for for going into next month. I, I'm sure they all want to be done by the 4th of July holiday, and I can assure you that uh, we're coming back the 3rd of July, so I'll be available for the <laughs> for the second round of commentary, as it were. And of course, I'll have my phone wherever I am, and the you know the internet will. Uh, well, actually, hopefully it won't work, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your wife and kids hope it yeah, doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Look, the conventional wisdom was that they might try to accelerate the release of the Dobbs opinion, at least the abortion case, in light of the leak. I don't know if that's been accelerated at all. I don't know if they're, I guess if the dissenting justices don't want to write their dissent as quickly, that can hold things up. Although in our history, it's not unheard of for even the court to say, you know, this is our ruling opinions to follow let alone dissenting opinions to follow. So that they could do that, less likely to do that. But you're right. The gun case, the, the big administrative law case, the powers not just of the EPA, but the administrative agencies more broadly and how much court should defer to them, a significant, significant case for all sorts of regulatory areas. School choice. Yeah, lots of big stuff coming down the pike. And of course, the justices are now working under tremendous pressure 
political pressure. So I, I, you know, well, it's always good to be, you know, life tenured on the highest court in the land, but I wouldn't want to be their clerks, at least. Well, the, yeah, the clerks, of course, uh, being asked, according to news reports, to have available to them their communications, uh, records of uh, email and so on for an investigation that's been under taking going on in the court about the leak of Samuel Alito's draft opinion, majority opinion, in the Dobbs abortion case on the Mississippi law and the opinion arguing for the repeal of uh, Roe v. Wade, which, uh, of course, is very controversial, uh, overturning a 50-year precedent. How much do you think, uh, Ilya, this leak has discombobulated things on the court? And and just a follow-up question here. One thing I'm very surprised at is that the nine justices together did not issue a statement saying that uh, they deplored the leak, just as a statement of solidarity going forward. That surprised me, too. And I think it's telling. You know, John Roberts put out his statement, and we've heard from a couple of other justices as they've been given a couple of speeches and engaged in public events. But the fact that, I mean, they weren't going to put out a statement that wasn't unanimous, of course. And so the fact that they couldn't get to unanimity on defending the institution that way is telling and it's unfortunate. I hope uh, I've written about this for other outlets that the investigation needs to be serious. I hope the marshal is using all the tools at her disposal. Whoever did this, whether it's a staff member, a clerk, a justice, him or herself, although that's unlikely, merits the most severe kind of professional punishment. I have lots of speculation analysis about whether any criminal laws were broken. That's a a separate discussion and less important, frankly, than that there be significant professional consequences for this. And for that matter, if the leaker leaked because he or she wanted to be a hero and thought it was the righteous thing, then they should own up to that and, you know, reveal themselves in a New York Times op-ed or MSNBC interview or whatever the case might be, you know, in a sane world, that person would not be able to work as a lawyer even anymore. But the way that bar associations and and even you know big law firms operate these days, that might not be disqualifying. But but in any event, truly an unprecedented and damaging event. You mean that the uh, partisanship over uh, judicial uh, matters is so severe, so strong that perhaps some law firms would hire somebody who leaked this as something of a hero? I mean, that would be pretty risky if somebody has demonstrated that they are willing to break the confidences of the Supreme Court. Would you want them handling the confidential filings of a securities case? I don't think so. That is a very reasonable uh, analysis, Paul, but you haven't been tracking or hanging out with uh, big firm lawyers and, and watching trends in the legal industry. And there are a lot of parallels to what's going on in corporate America. And so I think I would like to say that this person, while being eligible for a uh, the, the leak or if it is you know someone trying to perform a heroic service to the left, While they might be able to get an MSNBC contributorship or maybe a a professorship at Yale Law School, but the legal profession is closed to them, unfortunately, reality suggests that this would not necessarily be disqualifying in this day and age. Do you expect any change in the um, draft opinion, substantial change in the draft opinion, or more consequentially, a change in the voting lineup from the 5-4 that seemed to be uh, indicated by the draft opinion, which of course was leaked without any dissents or concurrences, but seemed to be 5-4 with the three liberals in opposition and Justice Roberts looking for a middle ground. Any indication? I mean, obviously you don't know, but uh, nobody does. But just speculate a bit on whether you think there'll be any change. I think it's most likely for the lineup to remain the same. The biggest probability of a change would be for John Roberts to perhaps join the majority, at least in part. That's just the way I think having a leak probably froze things in amber. If if the intent was to try to shame one of the justices, one of the more conservative justices in the majority to switch, I don't think it would have had that effect. As far as the opinion itself, it's interesting. You know, we've now had law professors and pundits, you know, commenting on where the opinion is strong, where it's weak, what needs to be shored up. So it's kind of a Wikipedia style suggestions for revisions to the opinion that, you know, Justice Alito may have considered some of that. The most likely change that we'll certainly see, even assuming the lineup is the same and the general gist of the opinion is the same, is to respond to the dissents and and any concurrences. And we can expect concurrences not just from John Roberts in a 
trying to present a so-called moderate position, but also I would expect at least Justices Thomas and Gorsuch to be on a concurrence that's more originalist than Justice Alito's draft that is not going for the deeply rooted in our nation's history standard under the Glucksburg case, but looking at the meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, the original meaning of the 14th Amendment and what rights it protected, that sort of thing. I could see that kind of concurrence. But anyway, the majority is likely to want to respond to any other writings, and that's perhaps the reason why that February draft, which is what's leaked by all indications by subsequent leaks, or at least as of last week or the week before, were no further drafts. And I think that's because Justice Alito, the author of the leaked opinion, was waiting for his colleagues' commentaries. I think for the good of the court, I would think if it would be better if Justice Roberts went over to the majority and made it a 6-3 opinion for an opinion that is this consequential and deals with stare decisis on a significant opinion by the court and a reversal of the 50-year precedent in row. I don't know if the chief will go there, but uh, I think that would be the best for the court in this case, rather than make it a 5-4 decision. All right, we'll leave it at that. Ilya Shapiro, thanks very much for uh, joining us and uh, sharing your experiences at Georgetown and expertise on the court. Delighted to have you, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Remember, Potomac Watch, you can catch it every day on your favorite podcast platform, and please send us uh, notes and questions to pwpodcast at wsj.com. Hope to see you tomorrow for another edition of Potomac Watch.